Hi everyone, it's 30th of June. Um, come down to the allotment to uh, get the rest of this cauliflower. Uh, bar one, one's not quite finished yet, but uh, and also to have a look after the high winds. We've had, you know, a few things have had a bit of a battering, but more so in the garden than here, to be honest. But um, we'll have a look at the back garden in another video. So um, got some cauliflower to harvest, some cabbage, and some more broccoli spears. Um, I'm gonna. My sweet corn is a little bit greener, but I've, I've actually made some uh, sort of feed from grass clippings steeped in water, just a bit of a nitrogen feed really, um, just to give a bit of a feed of that and see what it does. Um, so, and then I'll probably, you know, because people have been asking about our preserve stuff and things like that, so I'll probably do a video um, at the end of this one, um, when I sort of blanch today's harvest, which I probably I might do this evening, and then uh, it'll be attached to this video and uploaded over the next day or so. So, like I say, you saw it in the last video, you know, you can cut the plant and take it off to the compost table. but just easy, I tend to prefer doing that really, just pull everything down, expose the head, with a knife, a sharp one preferably, and just shear it off and that's, that's your cauliflower head. So it's fairly straightforward. You know, I could look, there's like one here, it's a little bit longer, but I'm not bothered, I took care. Uh, what, 18 last time. I think this is the one. That one's not ready yet. It's quite a big plant, that. So, but, uh, there's another three small ones, so I'll grab them. This one here, it's a bit of a topple plant, but it, uh, I didn't think it produced much, but he's made a small head. You know, not massive, but still a head, so I'll grab these two over here. One or two slugs knocking them out, which is why I don't mind taking them a bit smaller. Because it's the tiny slugs that cause a problem. Um, they go right up inside your cauliflower. Oh, you can get them out, well, it's going come out when you blanch it anyway. So, so there's another, another five heads there, and I've got another one to take. Um, which I'll probably do next week, so I'm, I'm intending to get these two beds replanted up pretty soon, to be honest, because it's getting to a point where it's tricky to keep seedlings alive at home. 
and hopefully uh, they'll crop later on in the season. So I'll get all this cleared up and then uh, do some broccoli spears. I'll take some more side shoots off these uh, Equeels broccoli or calabrese. And I'll try not to cut my finger this time. Well, they're opening out a bit, but they're nice and tender because I've not got anything ready to go in yet. Might as well let them keep putting the side shoots out until, uh, you know, for another week or so, or probably another week. And when I bring the other plants up, just pull these out and the uh, plan is pull some fresh in and, and go again. Yeah, I think this is probably third or fourth taking the side shoots. You know, you do actually end up with probably more broccoli from side shoots than you do from the main head. <coughs> you know, so probably a lot of people that just cut the main head off and pull the plants out when you don't really have to. Might as well get a bit of a, a bit of a secondary picking off it. You know, because the actual uh, stem on these are uh, fine, you know, you, you don't have to cut it right down, you can have the whole stem, you know, nice and tender to eat. I take them a lot smaller, it's just while I'm here, you know, because it's been about a week since I was here last, so all these have grown in a week. You get some like these that are just, they're not going to come to anything, they're just going to pop out into flowers, but... Can't grumble. There's always, uh, always going to be something that doesn't go quite to plan, but it's nice when the majority of things do. Blanch all these the same as I do with the cauliflower and the peas. I've got a lot of blanching to get done. You know, and then the, that kind of you can be sort of eating that while your other stuff's growing. And if all goes well, you get a, get a second crop in. That's one of the reasons I plant stuff as early as I possibly can to try and rather than go for one one harvest, you know, because there is there is enough time in one year. I mean, you can overwinter stuff, of course, but uh, some it depends how bad the winter is. So I tend to do more of this where I can double up my yield in the one growing season from sort of a February mid-February sowing and then uh, towards the end of May so you're looking at planting out sort of mid-April and sort of possibly mid-July mid beginning to middle of July so everything's had about you know 40 to 50 days growth in a seed, you know, in a seed pot, you know, so it's, you don't want to be too small. Um, where they've got a lot of top on them and not much roots, because obviously like these, you've got a bit of shock, because I tried keeping them in pots a bit longer, because I was waiting to get down. But, uh, you know, they weren't as the biggest heads, but you still, like I say, you still get the side shapes. And then your, your second batch should be ready sort of September, October. And then if you want an overwinter one, you know, you'd probably sow them, you know, ju well, July to plant out August to go for a harvest, you know, next April, May. But if they're not ready, um, You've got a bed that's kind of locked up, so it shortens your main growing season. You've got stuff that's overwintered. I mean, stuff like purple sprouting broccoli. You know, um, I don't, I don't do that myself. You know, that comes quite early in the year. 
you know, yeah, you can do the crop rotation, but I try and rotate as much as I can. But I'd probably say both beds don't have the same thing grown in um, more than twice in all the four years. I mean, it's okay to sort of like take brassicas out and put brassicas back in in the same year, obviously that's an issue, unless you've had problems with that. You know, if he's had like root fly or something like that, I won't go and put a lot of fresh brassicas in. Right, so that's all the side shoots done. I think it's some of these cabbage now, I think. These are the uh, golden acre, you know, because we've had some wet weather. The slugs have come. I've not sown any more of these. There is still time for me to sow some more. You know, there's a summer cabbage, you know, but uh, if I sow some now, probably take about 90 to 100 days these, so you might get another crop. You know, or the other option, um, if I wanted to, you'd, I'll show you when I, when I harvest this head, is if you probably don't snap all the foliage off, take what you, you sort of need. So they take the main head, and cut it there, and I tend to, you can, what I used to do, you cut a little cross, don't know why, cut a little cross at the top of that and it'll sprout mini cabbages. Um, it's a trick I used to do quite often, isn't it? you know, if, if I'd take these in June, early June, I'd think, well, I'll take that, because you can get another harvest of heads in the like, end of July, August. Kind of, you know, tennis ball size, but, um, you know, if you go for like three, or even two, you know, it depends if you want like four, you're going to get four smalls, but if you put two on, you get two slightly bigger. You know, but you've got to bear in mind that uh, this time of year now, where it's I've had a bit of rain and that, the old slugs like hiding under here. And if you go and plant some fresh seedlings out, these slugs will come out from here and go through there in, in, the, in the dark hours. So you have to just weigh up what you want to do. But, uh, take two of these. I'll probably take that one as well because it's quite uh, it's quite holy and it's just going to get worse and they just start to erupt when it gets to the season where they want to go to seed and they get a big glug of water. The heads just tend to split on them so just take them now. They, they keep okay for a little while you know. If you keep them stood up on a bit of kitchen roll so all the water drains out you know. Peel some of the outer leaves off to try and get get back you know to a sort of skin. So there's like split marks starting to happen here. Um, so obviously you get a big influx of rain going in there and it starts rotting. So you think, well, cut your losses and get what you can have. It's a good cabbage, good for cooking, good for making coleslaws with as well. You know, pretty easy to grow. So that's the uh, Golden Acre or Primo 2, that one. All right, as we're here, let's have a bit of, bit of a walk around, just a quick one. Not much has happened really. I mean, uh, they're a little bit better than sweet corn. They've had, as I say, they've had a, a bit of a water with some... Uh, sort of nitrogen mix I've made, got some grass clippings and steeped them in some water and then sort of squeezed it out and mixed it with some water in a watering can. Watered them, also sprayed them, so I've added up some salts in liquid seaweed as well. Some of my garlic had started to topple but I think that's wind that's pushed it over but um, I did see a couple of little flecks of rust before so it's sort of arriving. I've given them a bit of a spray with seaweed but I think another week or two and most of them will start dropping. Um, they're not massive, probably golf wall size, so I'm hoping this next week they'll plump up a little bit. Sprayed all them for, for blight, best I could, I couldn't actually get in between the rows properly. So I've just given a good drenching from the top mainly, and from, like from sort of side angle. Not for the best, so I've left these other Duke of Yorks in here for now because there was quite a few small ones, so I thought well, another week and uh, take the rest of that row out. Uh, I've planted a uh, plant up there, I'll show you that when I get up there. Uh, the one and only cauliflower that's left to uh, sort of finish off. I say this bed's completely empty now. All these cabbage are out. Broccoli spears have been chopped, there's a few tiny ones in there which I'll let, you know, sort of grow for next time up, hopefully next week, or I might come up again this week. Onions, I had three more that had uh, rotted off so Pulled them out, had a bit of a clean up here and there. Just a flat out style, so I think mildew will be on the way soon. But uh, we'll just keep an eye on them. I so say they've still a bit of growing to do. I mean, they're, they're, I don't know, about three inch, some of them now. So um, it's only a matter of 
sort of keeping an eye on for the next few weeks and hopefully not no big downpours so some mediocre nice dry weather because the beds are not dry at all not after the rainfall we've had anyway celery is uh, growing all right um need to start cleaning out around the bottoms a bit really because some of the earth's falling and then start thinking about how i'm going to sort of shutter them in or what i'm going to wrap them with courgette plants uh, there's a few courgettes so i'll leave them not too bothered if these sort of go marrow size here to be honest so i've got some at home in pots that are doing all right but they've kind of taken now they've started to grow you know after the sort of transplant shock and then peas uh, they're not ready for uh, picking yet got beetroot that's starting to got seeds so it's not going to do much uh, if it's still there put some seeds out by the time i clear the bed then i'll get some seeds if not i'll just shift them out and put something else in same with spring onions, um, not going to bring any more spring onions up here I don't think because it's pointless because Rust will just get them oh, any more I'll do in the back garden. All these peas have had a, a picking, um, so there's a, another load to pick yet. There were, there were a few blueberries sort of semi-ripe but I ate them instead of taking them on. Uh, this here is a squash plant, I just brought one up with me. It's Turk's Turban. Um, uh, basically I just dug a hole, like a spade deep, got some cabbage greens and whatnot, just chopped them up, put them at the bottom of it, so it's a bit like a pit really, a few sort of shavings in there, bridged it up a bit and put it in, so we'll see how it goes, I say I've got another two or three at home I think to bring, and I've got a couple of pumpkins, so as I clear this bed, I'll just put them in, if they come to something great, if they don't, it doesn't matter, you know the foliage can just be dug into the bed. It's just something to fill this ground up, because if I don't fill up, grass and weeds will just start. And I can still carry on picking the peas off this side. There's not many on this side, but some of them obviously come through. Um, go over this way. Oh, these are cobra beans. Pick some off them, you know, which I'm surprised to get some actually so soon. And I have to state they were looking last week. Just one plant down the end there I need to tie up because it's kind of drooping. So if everyone wants to get beans on they get a bit uh, stressed. I want to, that's why I thought I'll, I'll pick them small, give the plant a chance to get growing and all. Um, they've had a bit of a spray with some seaweed as well because obviously just, they're, they're a bit tatty. It's just They just need to pick up and uh, get wrapping round and when, because they'll naturally send a second one up as well and when you get a couple wrapped round it kind of holds them a bit and the foliage, when they, once they get tangled together it's not so bad. Sunflowers, they've had a spray as well and a bit of a feed, just a bit of a nitrogen sort of feed with the grass clipping stuff. So I'm hoping it's all right. Um, it's got to be better than nothing, it's worth a try. You know, and if it does perk things up, then I'll start looking at, you know, I need to start putting more nitrogen in the beds. So I've not used the old sulphate of ammonia for a few years. So I might start using that again. And uh, is today's sort of harvest. A bucket full of peas, and four cabbages, um, the primate, primal two, the golden acre, peas of the hearse green shaft, uh, spring onions, it's only pulled the um, Ishikura and the blood alum red, uh, bolt hardy beetroot, and some duke of york potatoes, that uh, misses it's kindly sized up, well there'll be potato salads and boilers and probably roast them to be honest because they make good roasters, there's the beans, not, not loads but I like them that size, you know, with them which have got a bean in them and such, nice and fleshy. Um, got three quarters of a bucket of uh, the quills broccoli side shoots and then the uh, cauliflower. You know, which is all, uh, all been quite good to be honest, you know, so I'll get home, have something to eat and then I'll, uh, I'll record a bit of uh, blanching I think and what I do with this sort of stuff once I get it home. Right, so I shall see you uh, in the kitchen. Right, back over front plot. So I'm going to start getting this veg all ready to sort of preserve or you know prepare for storing and that. So I've started with a beetroot, which basically trimmed uh, some of the roots off the end because these have like multiple roots because I saw them in, in a module tray. So I tend to put more roots out than you know a singular tap root like if you saw them direct. But it doesn't matter. You just just cut them off. Left a little bit of the top on. Should be in a little uh, roasting tray. Just put a little bit of water in the bottom. You know, about a centimetre, something like that. Just 
Yeah, if you've got a lid, you can use a lid if not. And a tin foil. You know, ideally if you're doing like a, some roast, a roast in the oven or something, you can put them in with that. But, uh, I'm just going to pop these in the oven now. Like gas mark 5, whatever that is in the conversion, I don't know. Um, about halfway mark of your oven. Put it in the centre for about 40 to 50 minutes. And then we'll uh, have a look what to do with them then. Right, the old beetroot's uh, done now, it's had a good bit of time in there. Red hot, so I wouldn't advise doing anything with it at the moment. You need to leave it to cool right down. You can put it in cold water to cool it, but sometimes it's better off to just leave it overnight to cool down and um, it skins quite easy but we'll come to that in a minute but, uh, next we're going to do some uh, peas right so these are the peas these are the uh, first green shaft so i'm going to blanch these first to freeze obviously but uh, what you need is you need a fairly big pan i'm not saying this is the right way to do it it's just the way i've always kind of done it and it works fine for me so there's probably umpteen other ways to blanch stuff um, it's just the way I've done it, it's pretty straightforward and simple. A fairly big pan with quite a lot of water in it. The key is, is don't try and do every, you know, all of them in one go because you'll cool the water down too quick. You know, I mean that is, uh, it's, I don't know what it is, I don't know if it's like a fruit strainer or something, or a, I don't know. Um, something my mum used to have and it, it helps scooping stuff out and that. But, uh, that's enough to put in. So water's bubbling away like a good one now. The idea is, is just drop them in and then back on. So that's just normal tap water with uh, probably about a teaspoon of salt in it. I mean there's probably about four litres of water in that pan. Um, and I tend to look at it, the peas will suddenly lift you know, start coming to the top. But on general, they want about a uh, minute and a half, two minutes. Um, so I'll take a lid off. Okay, there's a few that are starting to come to the top now. But, um, they all come to the top. And you kind of get a rolling boil back on it again if you want, but the key is you don't overdo them. It's just to, to preserve, you know, all the, all the goodness that's in them, you know. And so there's more coming up to the top now. And you don't have to stir them, but you can... Give me a little quick whirl around. The idea is, is the heat, heat on high, and then you just sort of, uh, I'll say, give them a minute or two. There's no real science behind it, you know. It's it's just, uh, I suppose, it, it cleans and um, it locks all the goodness in. You know, it, there's a bit about the cold water. I don't bother having iced cold water. I know you, a lot of people say I've iced. Make sure you have iced cold water. Have a bit of cold water in here and the sink's full of cold water out the tap. So that is always been good enough for me anyway, so it works alright. But it's uh peas are alright, but it's quite a long process to start picking them out of the pods, but you can sit there, sit yourself down with a film and whatnot and pod some peas and that. So I kinda reckon, you know, they're almost almost done. You know, sometimes you'll put peas in, they'll they'll change colour, they go really bright green. You can people put a bit of bicarb in and things like that, but uh, I tend to not. Just just salt and water. You know, and that's that's good enough for me. But it's starting to bubble a bit around the sides again now, so I think they're they're good enough for what I need. The thing I do, I keep the water boiling. And we use this to try and scoop as many out as I can in one go, which doesn't always go to plan. You get a few escapees dropping around. A bit of cold water in there. Not enough to really chill them off, but it just stops them uh, going wild. You know, and drying out and things like that. Because if, if they're exposed while they're still steaming, they will dry out. And the idea is, is that moisture can stay in there. And you can take a pan off the stove if you want, you know, to stop the bubbling. That escaping one there. 
Right, so I'm going to go over to the sink now and uh, kill these down. So, that's running. Sink's full of cold water. Just throw your peas in. And as they cool, they'll start to sink again. And while that's cooling for a moment, you can load your pan up with the next lot. So once you get a sort of uh, consistency going with you, you know, one in, one out sort of thing, it doesn't take that long. So water's bubbling away, shove them peas in, lid on, leave them to do the thing. Give these a whirly around. Then you need to uh, basically just leave them to drain really. Different when you've got like big things like cauliflower, you might want to cool it a bit longer in the water. You put them in there, they can, they can drain off. They're perfectly cold, not wrong with them at all. But it's just a case of kind of, by the time you've done that, you, you go back over and you, your next batch is sort of almost coming ready. Right, so I'll carry on with these and then we'll have a look at some else. That's the peas done, they've had a good uh, five, ten minutes to drain the bulk of the water off. So it's a good, good time to weigh them, so you can get your you don't have to weigh them, it's just a, a rough guide and see what you've sort of got, I guess. But um, let the scale zero and just uh, try and pour them in without them going everywhere. And uh, kind of see what you've got. Yeah, bear in mind, this is, I've had a little bit of a pick, and then obviously there's this pick, and I've probably got twice this again to come from the allotment. You know, there's 1.7. Three one kilos. It's like one point seven kilos of peas. Oh, so, you know, and it's probably grown all together from maybe sixty peas. You know, which is like ten pods. So it multiplies massively. You know, you can save a pod and use that pod when it's dried out to to grow your next batch of peas. Right, so that's them done. So they just need bagging now. Right. Back at the stove. Now we're going to do cauliflower, so I've got some fresh water on. You don't have to change it all the time. I've got some broccoli to do, but I'm going to do the cauliflower first because obviously the, the broccoli will tinge the, the water colour. Uh, if you've grown broccoli, well, cauliflower should I say, and it gets a bit discoloured, don't worry about it. It's only because it's a bit of sunlight or it's got a bit, bit of rain on it. You know, we've had a lot of rain recently, but it still goes down and it still tastes just fine. So, same again, don't do, try and do too much at once. Shove that in. It tends to want a little bit longer cauliflower. I'd probably say two to three minutes of cauliflower. So you let that do its thing, which will heat up full. You know, it, it's, a bit, it's, it's another job you have to do, but I mean, uh, like I say, I. I do this now. You can keep some to the side, now some fresh. I mean, I, I harvested some of the uh, green beans. The green beans, chop into sections or do them full if you like, and you use the same method for that as probably as peas, I'd say, you know, maybe a minute to two minutes for that. i drain them and cool them, but I wasn't even making that far. Me and Mrs. Adam Petit, we got some spuds and some cabbage. So that was tonight's pickings. But you know, if, you, if you've got plenty of other stuff to eat, I mean, we've got a lot of salad stuff we need to eat. Um, so this stuff's going to get uh, put in the freezer and it's something to eat through the winter months when you know obviously a lot of the salad stuff's kind of slowing down a bit and, uh, and you, you well by then hopefully your freezer's pretty chocker full so um, that'll sort of give you a good sort of food store over the winter months and possibly you know, into the hungry gap, you know, which is kind of probably April, May or May, June. You know, um, there's there's not much, there's a lot going on, but not much ready for harvest around then. Uh, so, 
it's just good to have you know a good backup i mean you, it's like cabbage you can shred cabbage freeze that if you want it does go a bit mushy but it's you know, it, it'll mix in with something you know but then you have your onion, onions that have stored and those that don't really store well you chop and freeze them garlic um i've still got a few bulbs of garlic left i, I did a job yesterday where i um i got about i don't know 30 30 bulbs of garlic from last year and um peeled them blitzed them up with a little bit of butter a real tiny bit and then uh froze them so it's already chopped because my garlic's not going to be ready for the next couple of weeks so um instead of it you know going soft it's still plenty hard enough but i thought well it's it saves on prep time you've got it done like that as well so same again takes over to the sink and uh We'll do a bit of broccoli now while that's cooling down. So usually I'd, I'd do the collie first and you know change the water if need be. Broccoli, yeah. the good thing with broccoli when you put it in the water it, the colour of it changes it goes a real lush lush green colour. Just let that water come back to a big rolling boil again. Then again not too much in Drop it all in, it'll just suddenly start going nice, like the green's changing right now. The right nice lush colour. I'll pop that lid on. And same again for that. You know, um, maybe a little bit less. It's usually if the water starts bubbling away okay, then it's had long enough, I'll say. And by no means a chef or anything like that, so it's just, it's, I just run it through this process and it, it's worked for me for, for donkey years. You know, but if you're going to make them into something and freeze it as a meal, then you don't have to, you know, because that whole process is done in the cooking process. You know, if you're going to mix it in, make, you know, anything you like, you know, it's cauliflower cheese or something like that and freeze it down, you can, you can do that. But uh, it's got a real lovely colour of green that now. You know, if I show you, uh, one that's kind of almost there. The colour of that, I don't know where you can make it out of this light, I don't know, but you can see the colours changing it. It's like um, a variety of asparagus that I grow called, I think it's Pacific Purple. It's purple, but when you boil it, it goes green. It's, it's, it's weird. I don't freeze and blanch asparagus. I tend to uh, not have enough of it. it. It tends to get picked and eaten. So that's starting to come to the boil again now. I think it's had probably long enough. This is where the scoop thing comes in handy. You know, you can try and get the bulk of it out. In one. You can use, either use tongs or a spoon or whatever. I used to at one time have a chip basket, I used to do it in that, but uh, that kind of uh, got thrown away a long time ago. The other thing I started doing. It's um, seems to be a bit easier for draining. Is uh, I have some cooling racks here, just baking cooling racks, and just simply uh, lay it out on that. You know, cause you try and like drain most of the water out. I mean, you could do this and then sort of leave it an hour to drain, it's just to get the bulk of the water away. And, uh, You know, it does just fine like that. And these are the, uh, the quills, broccoli, side shoots. I'll do the rest of uh, the cauliflower and the broccoli and uh, 
we'll have a look at something else. While they're uh, draining away before I uh, decide to bag them, I thought I'd have a look at some other things that I freeze. Um, so obviously, that onion, that's some of last year's Kelsey onions, or mammoth onions, they don't store very well, so they just get chopped up and froze. You don't have to do anything with them. Well, I don't anyway. <coughs> These are just frozen, frozen strawberries, just sort of topped. There is uh, plenty of them. And here is probably, I don't know, maybe three pound, three or four pound of blueberries. So with blueberries, raspberries and strawberries, um, you surplus you can do obtain puddings with them and whatnot. Um, if I can find a picture of what my missus made with some of the strawberries then I'll put it up now. But another thing I, I make with any of these, uh, more so blueberries because in the last few years I've had absolutely stacks of blueberries, is um, cheesecake. So when you get the quiche or flan, wherever, you, wherever you're from or whatever you used to call it, uh, I, I save these foil trays. Basically it's just digestive biscuits with, with butter, you know, melted, mixed together, there's icing sugar in it, gelatine helps it all set, there's cream soft cheese and I put sour cream in it and then I just basically some sugar and my blueberries in a pan a little tiny bit of butter until it's all gone to a pulp I blend it and I, I put it through a sieve um, you don't have to but things like you know raspberries that are quite full of seeds if you don't see just put it through a sieve you will get a few in there and then um, you mix your gelatine with it and you just put it on on the top so you've got like you know Biscuit, cream cheese, and then blueberry on top. You can make jams. I used to make jams with plum tree that I used to have years ago, but i have not bothered with jams. I tend to get through it like this. I mean, everyone in the house eats these, so I tend to do them in batches. I'll do like six or seven every couple of weeks. So, but you know, when you on average each year, the last few years I've been harvesting 20 odd pound of blueberries, it can go a long way. You can only eat so many, and then as they start to go a bit softer, you can freeze them. And then <clears throat> I've still got a few of these left. This is just tomato sauce um, with some other bits in it. Basically, um, my giant onions, my giant carrots, celery and tomatoes get made down into a sauce. So you can make lasagnas, you know, spaghetti bolognese, anything you like. It's just general cooking sauce, really. Um, you know, so I find I freeze it in these zip seal bags, nice and flat, because you can line shelves with it and things like that. Uh, so I've got about four of these left. So I had 20 odd litres of sauce I made all together last year. Plus you, you keep eating your tomatoes all year as well. You know, until they, they finish sort of September, October time. And then you're, you're back onto shop bought ones, which for those who've never homegrown tomatoes, uh, once you've eaten homegrown tomatoes, you go to a shop bought one and you'll think, ugh, not, not great at all. But if it's all you can get through the winter months, then fine. Um, so that comes in handy. Like I said with the uh, the garlic, what I did yesterday, just um, basically garlic with a tiny bit of butter, a real tiny bit of butter, um, and just froze them into cubes like that. So there's about like two cloves of garlic. You know, I thought, well, the, the other ones will be getting ready soon. So I've got, I've still got a few. I've left a few on a string. You know, which these were harvested almost a year ago. You know, and they're still fine. There's nothing wrong with them at all. You know, I had two strings, and I only had 60 or 70 odd. So we can use garlic in, in a lot of things. But obviously, you know, uh, when you've got loads of them, you, you could end up with some surplus. So I always save some for seed. So whatever the best out of this batch that's coming is decent, we'll use to seed the following year. So a variety of salt and white. It's just another option if you've got surplus garlic and you don't want to string it, you can freeze it. it cuts down on prep time. You know, so you haven't got to start messing about dealing with garlic when you're going to cook something. So, uh, right, I think I'll uh, bag this stuff up and we'll have a quick look at that uh, beetroot. Right, so that's all sort of prepared, ready to go into the freezer now. So, um, 
I'll put it in the freezer overnight and tomorrow all I'll do is um, I'll give them a bit of a shake about and then um, I'll, I'll, I'll bury them further back in the freezer. It's just to prevent anything sticking together too much. More so the peas than anything. That's why I leave a lot of air in the bag. They're just a zip lock with bags. These just normal zip seal ones. These are press seal. They're not as good, but they kind of um, the old enough. These I think the medium ones might be small size. Um, they have enough in there for a family sort of meal. <coughs> so you know, it's, it's, it takes a little bit of time and, and prep, but. You know, it's it's a good thing to do while you've actually got some on cooking. You know, um, you know, if you were doing it like a Sunday roast, you could do it all then. You know, because you, well, your cooker's free and your oven's going. So I'm gonna whack all this in the freezer and get the beetroot out. Right, I hope you can sort of make everything out to get the general gist of this. So this beetroot, you know, it was sort of put in the oven for about 45, 50 minutes. A bit of water in there. It's cooled down. You know, plenty enough now. So, keep your foil, I have something else to dispose of the skins. Now this is why I like to actually like roast them in, in a palace because to get the skin off it's quite easy, you just kind of press and the skin just peels off. Like so, get a little knife for trimming ends up. Cut where the, the, the stalk was, cut that off. Check the bottom end, doesn't matter, like. You can wear gloves if you want, you know, but uh, just be pre prepared to get to rather red hands. I'll just do a, a few of these to give you the idea of what I do with them. You can pickle them, you know, if you want, you know, you do get find a pickle mix, which I've not done for a few years. Because sometimes you know you buy the, the the pickling vinegar and it's a bit too uh, a bit too strong. But I like them as as they are like this, and nice, you know diced up in a, in a salad. Nice. You know if you're having a bit of a stew or something like that, a couple of slices on the side. It doesn't have to be pickled, you know, because a lot of people um, have only ever had beetroot pickled out of a jar, so. It's it's not for everyone, you know, there's only <laughs> there's only me in this house that eats it, you know, the missus doesn't like it, my dad doesn't like it. One of my sisters likes it like, but um my nan, she enjoys it, so I always send some to me now. But uh Yeah, we'll do one more and then uh, we'll package them up. Now, how long they last in these packages, I don't know, because um, these are always gone pretty quick. But I reckon, you know, uh, in a fridge, a good couple of weeks, not a problem. Put that to one side over there, get rid of that for the moment. I'm just simply going to slice these now. I mean, when they cook like this, they slice so easy. Probably nearly centimetre slices. You can cut it whatever size you want. Centimetre will do for me. You know, yeah, you can put these in a zip seal bag if you want, but I don't think they'll keep as long. You can wash my hands a little bit. And uh, do the packaging bit now. This is like a little uh, vacuum pack thing. Don't know how much it was, I don't think it was that dear, but it's one my uh, sister bought me a couple of years ago. Close that down, just seal the end. So, so now that's sealed across, I don't know where you can see but sealed right across there. Then you sort of like just cut it. 
you know, where you think's sort of enough. You could do, you could vacuum pack a lot of your veg if you wanted to. But um, you know, I do it when I buy meat. Go and buy a load of meat and chop it up. And uh, just chuck it in. It's just a case of sliding all your bits of beetroot. You can overlap them or whatnot you want. I usually do. And they tend to slide about a bit. You know, you can get plenty in the bag. It's nice to have it sort of packaged, you know, so it'll do a you're intending on it a couple of days on the trot then kind of what, a couple of beetroot at least Just trying to sort of get it kind of levelish so it doesn't have to be brilliant and you kind of if they're baby beets you know little tiny ones like golf ball size just do them whole that's why I used to, used to do originally, just do them whole, but slice them like this. You can just snip a corner off and slide them out onto your plate. No red fingers or anything like that. That's the only problem, it's the old red fingers. And sometimes if you cut this a bit short, it doesn't, doesn't play ball. place it where it needs to go, click it down and it, it should vacuum and seal now. Uh... What I'm going to do is give it another secondary bit of a seal just to make sure because you can get it sometimes it'll leak out in the fridge. So there's the beetroot. That's all I do with it, vacuum pack it, shove it in the fridge. I've never tried freezing it. I don't know what it'll be like, but yeah. Probably keep for about a month like that, maybe, maybe even longer. I've no idea. Now before I go, I'll just show you quickly how the spring onions. Um just basically pull it back till you know you've got some of the, the outer skin off. You know, sometimes it'll split away at the bottom here a bit, but don't worry about that. Just get it back so it's like one skin. Get a knife, a clean one, not one that's covered in beetroot juice. And then I'm going to chop it, but I'm not going to cut through the actual onion, I'm going to actually snip the roots at the bottom. And then I tend to just where it sort of splits here, I tend to lop it off around there. A lot of people throw that bit away. Just kind of trim it up. You can throw the, the tops of it away if they're a bit, a bit manky. And the bits like that, chop them up dead fine. Freeze it if you want. You know, if you're going to put it into sauces, a bit like a herb type thing. But um, it's, you can use that in making potato salad. Just chop it up nice and fine. It's a bit like a, you know, um, chive that type of thing. You know, just you mix it with just mayonnaise out of the cheese sandwich. But that uses them tops up. You know, so you're not actually throwing that much away. But what you do throw away, it's never a waste. You know, it's like in here. It's all scraps from pea pods. I've got a big bucket full of pea pods. That's all compost which feeds next year's plants. So, thanks for watching. Um, I thought I'd do this because a few people have been asking about it. So, like I say, I'm not a cook or a chef. I just, it's just the way I've done it for a while and um, it seems to work okay for me. So, thanks for watching. Take care and I'll see you next time. Bye.